This is the story of a ship. A ship that over 200 years ago was sent on a secret voyage of adventure and discovery. One that was to alter the course of history and change the face of the world as we knew it. The ship was called the Endeavour and the commanding officer for the Royal Navy, one James Cook. On board were almost 100 men, officers, seamen, marines, scientists and artists. Together they set sail from England and through uncharted seas searched for undiscovered land. For those men, it was the 18th century equivalent of going to the moon, or even beyond. Two hundred and thirty-four years later, on an exact copy of the Endeavour, a 21st century crew of volunteers is going to follow in the wake of Captain Cook himself. For six weeks, we're going to attempt to sail one of the most exciting, but also one of the most dangerous legs of this epic voyage. Using, as far as we can, 18th century methods, we're going to take the ship three and a half thousand miles, following Captain Cook's route up the coast of Australia, right across to Jakarta in Indonesia. Brace the Jump up! It's an attempt to learn firsthand something of the determination and endurance those 18th century sailors possessed. Most of our volunteers have sailing experience. Some are even from the Royal Navy, like Mickey. As we can see, we're at probably about the highest point on the ship. There's no higher than this. Wrestling with the sail and a gasket. Hanging on with my little toes, all but the aid of a safety net, and brains. Because you can't be clever coming up here doing this. Unlike the original endeavour, we have women on board. Claire here is our doctor, and she joins others from a variety of backgrounds. Away, starboard side, braces, firm up, and belay, port. I think the women who are here are all quite gutsy women, and they're not the sort of shrinking violet, oh, I must polish my nails type of girl. I mean, there's nothing now that's all closed to a woman. There's no job that's closed to a woman anymore. So um, the sky's our limit, really. There's nothing that they can stop us doing. So uh, I don't see any reason why we can't do this. In modern society today, there'd have been outrage if you'd only brought blokes. And, as part of the working crew, we have academic historians who look on this as a unique opportunity to further their understanding of the period. We mostly live in our imagination. We mostly live through texts. Uh, we don't know what it's like to have to get up aloft and furl a sail or ungasket a sail. It's an impossible fantasy for most people to go back physically back in time into the vehicle of the very period that they're studying. And that's what we're going to be doing on this voyage. It's a fantasy come true. Port of Cairns in northeast Australia. And this is where our story starts as the final preparations are made for the long voyage in front of us. For the next six weeks, I'll be wielding this camera and trying not to get in the way. At the moment, only the 15 permanent crew are on board, professional sailors who are loading the ship with provisions. As near as possible, we're going to be eating the same diet as the one Cook's crew did. 
Like them, we will have a goat for milk. And we'll also have chickens for eggs. Our volunteers have yet to arrive. They'll be boarding in a few hours, not here, but at a special anchorage just around the coast, Mission Bay, exactly where Cook anchored his endeavor in 1770. So really, this is a story of two adventures, one about to unfold, and the other, that of the original endeavor over 200 years ago, James Cook's own story. Friday, 29th of July, 1768. Constantly employed taking on board stores and provisions, poultry, pigs, sheep, and one goat. Throughout the summer of 1768, the endeavor was in Deptford, being readied for a voyage to Tahiti to carry out astronomical observations. But on board, there was a sealed envelope of secret instructions, not to be opened until the ship had put to sea. In the 21st century, our volunteers are making their way to meet the ship at Mission Bay. They are British, Australian, and just as on Cook's ship, we have some Americans as well. The only way to our rendezvous is through the sacred land of the Yarraba people. No, 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 that, that's bubbling. Could be someone in there. Also joining us on the ship are Australian Aborigines. Uh, we've lost most of our country. And New Zealand Maoris, the very peoples most affected by the coming of Cook. Friday, 26th of August, 1768. At 2 p.m., got under sail and put to sea, having on board 94 persons. Secret by the commissioners for executing the office of Lord High Admiral of Great Britain. In pursuance of His Majesty's pleasure, you are directed to put to sea as soon as the observations in Tahiti are finished and observe the following instructions. There is reason to imagine that a continent of great extent may be found to the southward of the tract of any former navigators. If you discover the continent above mentioned, you are to employ yourself diligently in exploring as great an extent of the coast as you can, carefully to observe the nature of the soil and the products thereof, the beasts and the fowls that frequent it, and in what plenty. You are also, with the consent of the natives, to take possession of the convenient situations in the country, in the name of the King of Great Britain. So that was it. For some time, it had been suspected that an immense landmass existed in the Southern Hemisphere. If it was there, Britain wanted it. It took over seven months to reach Tahiti at a cost of five lives. After another three months, astronomical work done, Cook followed the secret orders, and the endeavor headed south in search of the fabled landmass. Eight months later, having discovered nothing except two small islands in a great ocean, Cook headed west into totally uncharted waters. It was all sea. For weeks, it was all sea. Land ho! Cook had discovered not the great southern continent, at the completely unknown east coast of New Holland, today's Australia. The destiny of the South Pacific was about to change forever, and the fate of an entire people lay in the balance. Okay, there it is. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Where are you? Hello. 
Oh, there she blows, huh? Everyone. It's amazing. See the ship? I was sort of hoping she'd be a bit closer than that. <laughs> That's the row, buddy. We're gonna roll. We're gonna roll hey, Ricky. Yeah. We're going to roll that far. We don't even have to stop, mate. It's going to take us four hours to get there. <laughs> I'm hoping that piece of land there is Jakarta. I really am. <laughs> We must now row out to the Endeavour, four miles offshore. And a seat facing backwards. OK, right, one, sitting here. Okay. We have to go out in relays, and waiting their turn, two of our historians, professors Jonathan and Ian. We're quite moved, really. This is the first time we've, uh, we've actually seen the real thing. Yeah. It's all been in the imagination now. <laughs> now I'm trying to print it on my retina. That's right. And also to see the view, as they say, from behind the trees. Yeah. The view of indigenous people yeah. from this yeah. side of the beach. That's yeah. how we're seeing it. Dip on left. Guys, dip on left. Okay. okay, this is your left, this is left, your left, this is your right. Dip on left. Whilst everybody waited to row out to the ship, Bob, a local Aboriginal elder, and himself one of our volunteer crew, guided me along a secret track up the mountain overlooking Mission Bay. we were in search of a sacred cave he had last seen as a boy. Inside, he said, was something mysterious, of relevance to our adventure. Let's go, I'll call Dip, he wrote. Dip. Dip. This will be all day. Dip. Near the top of the mountain, Bob went ahead. He had to ask permission from the ancestors to allow us to enter the sacred cave. He showed me that we can go through. Uh, but the uh, last year's one thing, anything you see, uh, that's of interest to you. By all means, pick it up, but put it back in the same spot. Of course. Yeah. On the roof of the cave was a sun, a moon, a turtle, and there, what looked like a three-masted ship. That's certainly the endeavour. Well, that's amazing. There's certainly one mast there, another mast there, put the mast over here. The bowsprit. The sail. This was possibly one of the first Aboriginal recordings of the European arrival on these shores. Saturday, 28th of April, 1770, James Cook left the Endeavour in his longboat to start exploring the coastline he had discovered. And using an identical boat, we are going to board our ship for the first time.
The captain and gentlemen went on shore, but were opposed by two Indians with spears. Notwithstanding, the captain tried by all means to persuade them to lay their weapons down with presents and trinkets, but all to no purpose. On our approaching, two men made towards us. Their countenance bespoke displeasure. They threatened us, fearful of hostile intentions. Wow! That is fantastic! Some natives opposed the landing, on which account the captain was obliged to sting one with small shot. Musket! Vanessa, one of our historians, is not surprised by our visitors. He's upset that we're here. I don't know if he was talking about us or if he was talking about Cook. Came here and left nothing. Just took. I think the Aboriginal communities here have every right to feel angry about the presence of the endeavour. Uh, I mean, it's a. Whether or not we want to do things in a kind of sensitive way, it's nonetheless a symbol of oppression to them and there are a lot of issues that they would like to see addressed. So if the symbol is present, then, then they're bound to be angry about that. When Cook landed, um, it began to erode our tradition, our culture. That's why we got those protesters out there. Would you happy to be coming on the interview yourself? Yes, I, I had to, uh, to reach in uh, very deep and uh, have a hard, long, long think about it. But the option of looking to the future would far outweighs dwelling on the past. And uh, I see that as a, as a better way of moving forward. By mid-afternoon, the protest is over, and the volunteer crew are finally aboard the Endeavour. Yeah, right. And uh, Alex, the other guys on your watch, so bring them down here. Welcome aboard, Ian. Fantastic. This is a moment, isn't it? <laughs> this is outstanding, Chris. I am gobsmacked. Uh, I want a job. <laughs> I want to jack the Navy in and come work here now, because this is, this is a dream come true. This is just outrageous. I'm just in awe. It's really unbelievable. So, this is our world for the next six weeks. Just 109 feet 3 inches long and 29 feet 2 inches wide, and draped with rope, 18 miles of rope. Up the shrouds to the courses, over the fighting top, then up to the topsails and the high to gallant yard arms. One hundred and thirty feet above the deck and the belly of the ship. And down below, the living decks of the 18th century sailor. Hey. Yeah, watch your heads. JB, you're going to be in mainmast five. Okay. All right, this doesn't correspond to your number. So one end of your hammock is slung here. Uh -huh. We see MM5. Uh -huh. The other end, above Phil's head. Right, Cyril, yes, sir. you're going to be in three. In this one space where the food is cooked as well, okay. the bulk of the around. crew, 45 of us, will sleep, Followed eat down. and relax okay. as best Let's we can. Forward so you can find it. And then three. All the way. The, bones. the senior members of the permanent crew have tiny cabins, just like Cook's officers, towards the stern of the ship. Um, what Cook has done... Immediately above is the officer's mess, where our navigators will be trying to master the complexities of 18th century navigation. And next to this, right at the back of the ship, Cook's own great cabin, where our botanist will study plant specimens collected from shore. Right then, leave your bed in here. We're going to get the hammocks, drag them this way. All right, just bend down, make your way aft. Just going to pass a few out. 
It's a bit rusty, <laughs> to say the least. It's not uh, the Savoy <laughs> by any stretch of imagination. I just can't find anywhere to smoke at the moment. <laughs> Banned. We'll see. What's for dinner, Caroline? Same as it's going to be every night for the next 44. Actually, no, we're having nothing, enough. Yeah, um, be we're having salt beef with um, just like a big casserole, big stew. I'm secretly terrified that all the food is going to be inedible. But um, it's my great pleasure to cook good food for people so they enjoy it. So I'm worried, but we'll see. You can. <laughs> OK, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a bit of hush over this side of a look. Welcome to Endeavour. Hey, and all that that entails. Uh, the captain and his permanent crew start up training car. straight away. OK, who wants to climb? This can be a very dangerous world until you understand it and learn to respect it. The 18th century sailor's greatest fear on a wooden ship was fire. And as well as sudden death from a crashing mast, there was also the risk of amputation from a snapped rope. Add to that drowning and a scurvy, it's no wonder the average age of a sailor was only 25. Cook had a crew of nearly 100, knowing he might lose up to a third of them over the three years of his voyage. We don't plan on getting scurvy, but our safety instruction is intense. When we're handling lines, always assume that there is something heavy connected to the other end of it. Transfer one hand first, climb up a little more, your second hand will then go onto that bar. Keep climbing up with your legs so that all the weight is borne on your, your strong quads. Just push up with your legs. My oh, this is horrible. You'll be right. The only way to work the sails is to climb up the rope shrouds and then over the futtocks and up to the yard arms. How's the climb, mate? Doddle, lovely. I liked it. It was a bit, uh, a bit dodgy climbing over the futtocks, but I've had that trouble for years now. Which are the futtocks? The overhang bit. That's your, that's your futtocks. You should always know where your futtocks are. Salt meat, this is all very experimental. I know you have to steep it in fresh water to get the salt out, but how long, I didn't know. So I put it in about 9 o'clock this morning, and then about every hour, I gritted my teeth and had a tiny taste of the raw meat to see how much salt was left in it. So now I've got a fair idea of how long to steep it. I'm in the process of taking it down to my galley and chop it up and add it to my frying onions and carrots. Any ideas which way you can turn the wheel? Think of it like you're driving a car. Zero six zero's over here. Zero one zero's over there. We want to go to zero one zero, which is over there. So in your car, which way do you turn the wheel? Yeah. You turn it that way. We need to yeah? set sails, exactly okay. The same what we've got to do at the moment, this sail is furled, all right? Which means it's stowed and it's safe. Weather won't affect it, okay, but we can't sail. So, what I want to do is get everyone onto the yard and I want to unfurl the sail. I don't think, I've cut the quantities down tonight because it's the first night, and I don't think people will be hungry enough to eat too much. It's hot, they're a bit, you know, anxious, it's all new. So, here it goes, it's starting to sizzle. When you're equal with the yard, get your safety harness and clip on to the black line that is on top of the yard. Okay, it's called the jack stay. That is your safety line, okay, and clipped on. Once you're clipped on, you will say nice and loud so everyone can hear you, stepping on port or starboard. Once you've said that, and making sure they know, then put one foot across the, the foot rope, other foot across the foot rope, and you are on the yard, okay? Why do you have to tell them? Because if someone else steps on here now, because it's slack, if someone else steps on here, yeah. it'll push me up, uh -huh. and if I don't know they're stepping on, then I'll end up going, whoa. Cook's men had no safety harnesses, and if they fell into the sea, they would probably have drowned, as virtually no 18th century sailor could swim. Mm. Yum. <laughs> it actually tastes all right. It tastes all right. Is 
said with a smile. She said with a smile. Are you all steamed up, darling? <laughs> Finally, there's toilet training. The heads. Basically, with the heads, if you haven't eaten it, don't put it in there. <laughs> if you know what that means. But this one's mainly for the girls. 18th century heads could not have been simpler. Just holes and bits of wood over the bow, actually called seats of ease. But 21st century regulations forbid us to use the seats of ease on the Great Barrier Reef. And until we're in the open sea, we'll have to use the modern heads down below. But we are given an ominous warning. The paramount thing is to close off that grey valve. Okay, that is an open access to the sea. So if that valve is left open and we start getting a bit of pressure by rolling, that water will come straight up the system, plus whatever was the last entry into the system, and it will be all down there. Now, I don't know about you, but my two pet hates on here, one being late for a watch, and two, like walking around in someone else's piss and crap down there. So, close the grey valve. OK, foremast watch! Stand by four course live! Suddenly, a wind blows up, a strong southerly. Okay. Blue. Yeah. Ease that out, Vanessa. Hold your top so. All the way. Nine heavy yard arms need to be turned to the wind, and the sail set before the one-ton anchor can be dragged off the seabed. Let's weigh anchor. Prepare to weigh anchor. Walk forward on the capstan. big machine is going to start to move any minute now. And this week, we're going to sail so well. This is going to be awesome. Walk harder on the capstan. Keep walking forward. Slowly on the capstan. been waiting for the wind to get in our soul. This phenomenal southerly blow is going to take us in the right direction. We've got to work as a team. We really have to throw away 21st century individualism and we have to acquire the collective benefit of the whole. Working together being ready to help people who can't manage and being helped yourself. I think you've got to be prepared to eat dirt because these are highly skilled people, the professional crew here. And, you know, we're dolt, we're dolts, we're blunderheads. We'll get there, but, you know, uh, willingness is not enough. You've got to acquire the skills. Stop it off, stop it! Through there? Yes, sir, that's your job. Hang on. Hey, I'll come in. Let's think right there.
Even as novices, we make good progress up the coast. The wind carries us some 12 nautical miles along Cook's original route. But the wind comes and the wind goes. And now, as evening draws in, and with coral reefs all around us, it's thought safer to stay here for the night. Whoops. I think I've just covered Chris in boiling oil. Are you eating meat, Christian? Yeah, I guess so. Alrighty. Are you vegetarian, Christian? I was up until about five minutes ago. <laughs> it only lasted five years. Oh, just a fad then. Five what years? This looks lovely, Caroline. This is going to be good. This has got to be better than the food on board a modern warship. Is that where you normally live? Yeah. Ah. That doesn't say much. That does not say much for modern warships. Ah, oh, this course in the Royal Navy, the, the RN cookery course, you know. Nobody's ever passed it. That is really salty. It's good, maybe it's or something. It's salty, isn't it? Very salty. Yeah. The ship's biscuits are... Um... Very fine if you can knock them around with a hammer. <laughs> That's a biscuit. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't look too unappetising. The 18th century sailor would have loved this food. For most, it was better than anything they got at home. Each sailor would have been taking on about 5,000 calories a day and would have put on weight. I will never, ever slug off an RN caterer in my, my whole life <laughs> after eating this. Oh. What's your reaction, guys? The meat is salty. Yeah, it's salty. Yeah, yeah. The vegetables, the vegetables are very good. Good, OK. Well, here we go. Welcome to the 18th century. <laughs> I've got, I've got salt in my hair. Okay, my feet ache and smell like of mud. And I've got a film of. Everything on my hands. Yes. Yeah. You've got yes. that too. That's good. And that's day one. <laughs> hey. I worked harder today than I've worked in months. And I uh, just want to get bed sorted out. Side by side, 45 of us try to sleep anchored somewhere between the 18th and the 21st century. For the snoring, that'd be a really comfortable sleep. Yeah. Well, your hammock is actually sawing a nice hole in my neck. <laughs> <laughs> look, 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 I should loads of room with Cole, Cole is actually interesting because he doesn't snore much. Yeah, he can rolling your Mickey. The whole Mickey's uh, like a shit. Mickey's there for Jersey foot rolling. Cole's is just like someone just chopped the head off the goat. You know, it's like blood gurgling. <laughs> 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 Who's <laughs> the best snorer? That's a snoring Mickey, bird. Mickey, 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 right there. Mickey, 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 Mickey,
Yeah, I was Wake them up and then look yeah. really innocent. That's actually quite a nice way to do it. <laughs> That'll go up. After yesterday's protests, Bob, Rico and Bruce have decided to hoist the Aboriginal flag. Do you want to know the meaning of this flag? I do. Do you know? The black symbolises the people of this country. There's yellow here, it's the sun. And the red is the blood that was shed for this land. That's the symbolism behind this flag. And it's now the Aboriginal flag. All right. Let it fly. We raise this flag in the spirit of reconciliation. And we believe out of reconciliation, we'll have a treaty. One day, soon we hope. That's it. Tara Mufa, one here. You know, I'm interested to find out more about what the animosity is still between the Aboriginal people and the, mm -hmm. the British. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously we had, when we were coming on board, we had the uh, boat circling around, flying the Aboriginal flag that was not saying the nicest things about Captain Cook. But uh, I think it was important to them to raise their flag on this ship. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very, very touching. All right, guys, um, we're going to go into cleaning now because uh, you guys are so messy. Big scrub out. Clean up the goat, clean the chickens up, make the world beautiful. OK, so... Go on, eggs, get it done. Every day, Cook's crew would spend hours cleaning and scrubbing the ship as a protection against disease. A task that is no less vital today. It might gooey and it might stinky, but it's really nice down here. Shady, close to the water, it's like my own little balcony. <laughs> I thought before I got on it, it was going to be a lot, a lot of hard work, and it's, it's even more than I thought it was going to be. I just hope everyone's mood stays as cheerful as it is at the moment. A few arguments I expect. I'm only predicting this, I don't know anything. People start getting really fed up, fed up with the food, fed up with living, sleeping in a hammock, fed up with discipline, basically. A lot of these people never, has never lived with discipline or had to been, have always been told what to do. They've always been free spirits. And then that is going to affect some people. They're not going to like it. They're going to take offence to it. Living in the Navy has given me a certain insight to people in general and um, how people react. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm not... I'm not university educated, I'm just, I've just been around a bit, as it were. Um, I'm just using a prediction. <laughs> I'm doing right here. I think that's where we should do it. No, I did. It's like that's that 36. Is it? It's perfect. 36, 27, 36. I'd say that was a 38. Thank you, Al. Anyone else? <laughs> Who else wants some? Doug, are you up? <laughs> I don't know, she just these. said measure me in. <laughs> and uh, and Bruce fumbled it for a second and I stepped in. <laughs> I didn't fumble it. He's trying to do it. I didn't fumble it. He He's just stepped in. <laughs> <laughs> it was my job. <laughs> uh, she doesn't want to know in meters. With the wind back in our sails, we're heading north once again exactly on Cook's route. And after 24 hours, we arrive at a wooded promontory jutting out into the Great Barrier Reef. In June 1770, James Cook was in the same place. At latitude 16 degrees, six minutes south, and longitude 214 degrees, 39 minutes west, is a point of land I named Cape Tribulation because here begun 
all our troubles. Here we are at Cape Tribulation, and, and from the point of view of the historians, this is a, an important moment because this is where, almost by premonition, I suppose, Cook starts to see a, an ordeal in front of him, quite a long and protracted ordeal. He's having difficulty managing to sail past this mass of land, and he's starting to get into trouble with coral reefs. And uh, this, from this point, really, almost until we reach the, the, the far north, he's, he's in a state of, I think, acute anxiety. He's not showing it, because he's a very phlegmatic Yorkshireman. Uncannily, it is from this point, Cape Tribulation, that our own troubles begin. Problem oh, she's just doing the same thing. Every time I go to milk her, she just um, gets upset about it and won't stay still. So she just tries to kick over the pan and does the runner. So I don't know what's wrong with her at the moment. The goat's sick, and so is Vanessa. <laughs> An extension to the yard arm snaps. Okay. And then there is the bird that wouldn't go away. A bird landing like that culturally is there's something wrong. That's a sign of some sort. Really? An omen? Yeah, it, it has happened to me before. Really? Yeah. It, uh, it could be a death in the family, it could be, <laughs> could be anything. The next morning, another problem. Just a couple of things. Um, I don't know if you Topman told you about the grey valves and what would happen if they get getting left on. Got yeah. one more chance. Three left on last night. So, and you don't even have to open the stinking grey valve to pump the urine out, okay? A little bit of consideration for your other 55 shipmates well, those toilets will get turned off. They will. It takes nothing to pump the urine through, OK? OK, the washing should be gone by now. I know it wasn't dry. That's probably because it got left out overnight. It's going to get dewy, so... Get your washing done as quick as you can and uh, get it down as quick as you can. We look like a uh, Chinese junk at the moment, but that's life. So did Cook's ship. Because <laughs> there were people you know? aboard and they have to they wash, wash and they have to dry things. Yeah. Ah, uh, they were stinky sailors. They were bloody good week. sailors. <laughs> That's Sorry. right. We're just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> just you guys are just thinking. No, I'm we serious, think. Gordon. This isn't a cosmetic issue. This is an issue about people living. Yeah. We've got to have dry clothes yeah. if we're going to be decent yeah. sailors. Yep, yeah. yeah. exactly. That's why they got left up there overnight. And you got them. It's a waste of time drying them out during the day, isn't it? It's not a holiday. We're trying to sail, rough it, tough it. It's not... Um, no, a holiday on, a, on Daddy's yacht. So if this stuff's dry, Dom, we'll get this down and we'll get the world rolling. Let's go. We're just told that this boat shouldn't look like Daddy's yacht. In fact, the, the people who are, who've got the idea it should be Daddy's yacht, it seems to me, are Gordon. Cook understood that the thing that made a boat work is keeping the men, and in this case, of course, women, happy. And of course, you let them wash whenever there was an opportunity. We have got to be able to live. When we do finally get washing, we're told we've got to get the bloody washing down again. I'm speaking out because other people don't dare to speak out. They're afraid to. But I'm a 55-year-old man and I've been around in the world and so I'm not, they can do what they like to me, I don't care. I don't think this is seaman-like thinking. I don't think it is. I think it's luxury yacht thinking. It's the exact thing that they're accusing us of. This ain't no pleasure cruise, baby.
But our problems are as nothing compared to the fate that befell James Cook and his ship on the night of the 11th of June, 1770. That's next week on The Ship. Yeah.